Clarita here, and I've got a new sponsor, DistroKid. If you want to release your music into the world, DistroKid's the easiest way to get your music into all the major streaming platforms, unlimited uploads, and keep 100% of your royalties. And because you're a Design Freaks listener, you get 30% off. Go to distrokid.com slash VIP slash Design Freaks. DistroKid. Hello, thank you for tuning in. This is the Design Freaks podcast, uh, where I like to talk about music industry art and design, uh, graphic designers, record packaging, the stories behind the sleeves. My name's Clarita. I am your host. I am a graphic designer here in Seattle, Washington. And today we're going to talk about rain and blood. Rain and blood. Let's talk about rain and blood. Um, so I'm kicking off spooky season here in Seattle where it's already dark and it's already raining blood. If you like this episode subject matter, if you like metal, if you're into thrash metal, you should check out the Metallica episode. Uh, It's called Kill the Lightning of Puppets. It's it's all about the stories behind the artwork for the first three records uh, and Metal Up Your Ass, the the toilet one, the toilet ears. Uh, And I'll go ahead and put a link to that in the show notes. So yeah, it's not only about Metallica, but I also, because they used uh, the font Eurostyle so well, and I love Eurostyle, I also, there's a section of that episode called Back to the Font, and it's all about the history of Eurostyle. It's actually really interesting. Back to Slayer. is by Larry Carroll, who I'm going to tell you about. The design is by Steve Byram. But before we talk about those freaks, designfreakspodcast.com, everything's in the link tree. If you can hit the donate button, it is not free to produce the podcast and keep it running. And uh, I really appreciate everybody's donations and or words of support keeps me going. And if you have a suggestion for one of these covers of cover shows or know someone I should interview, there's a contact form. You know how it works. And as usual, for more music related podcasts, check out ruinousmedia.com. Okay, uh, let's talk about rain and blood. Rick Rubin found these two freaks to contribute some visuals to this project. So the first one I'm going to talk about, like I said before, Lawrence Carroll, I'm going to call him Larry. He was born on October 26, 1954 in Melbourne, Australia, but he's American. He grew up here. Anyway, he sadly passed away in um, 2019 RIP. He was 64 years old. That's so young. Um, So at the same time that he worked for Slayer, He was a political illustrator, and he contributed artwork to The Progressive, The Village Voice, New York Times, uh, Newsweek, etc. The list goes on and on. I had a hard time finding any of these, though. So if y'all can help me out, send those in, like comment with links or whatever in the YouTube comments. So he was living in New Jersey when he got a call from producer Rick Rubin in 1986. Rick Rubin was drawn to like his creepy artwork. And I have, I'll put up on the screen some of his later paintings, or maybe they're earlier. I can't even tell, but he's had many exhibitions. His work is really creepy. And it's the kind of artwork that looks, it's not too busy. There's not a ton going on, but you can tell a lot of thought and effort went in. Like, Kind of like there's this stitched together canvas thing that's like off white and kind of dingy looking and Frankenstein y, um, very unsettling. Basically, Larry says that, you know, he wasn't being hit up for album artwork. So this was very strange. And he said, he says he thought they were afraid of what they would get. I was always told my work was too dark for most folks. So Slayer was a good fit for me. There we go. So then um, the artwork he delivered 
to the band, he says, he describes it as a pretty grotesque cover. Um, so it was a mixed media collage festooned with corpses, severed heads, and at least two figures rocking visible if silhouetted erections. At first, when I read this, I thought they were corpse erections, which if corpse erection is not a metal band, I'm too lazy to look it up, but uh, it, that needs to be fixed right away if not if that's not the case. Anyway, so there are hidden silhouetted erections. And if you know anything about me, I like hidden artwork. I like thing I like when designers hide easter eggs and when you when things are not obvious right away. Um so here he explains where they are and I'll put it up on the screen so you can see. He says, uh you see the guy with the bishop's hat right by his hand is his dick. No one ever caught that. Carol gloats. I don't know about that, Larry. I'm sure somebody saw it. I mean, now that I see it, I really see it. It's right by the name of the album. Um, I want to know back from you guys. Did you ever notice that? Or I guess if you had read this interview, you would have. But um, wondering who noticed it on their own. Anyway, he says, now look at the guy next to him. He's got one sticking out too. And boy, does he. At first I was like, what? Where? Oh. <laughs> And then he says, uh, still, despite the piece's shock value, the members of Slayer were not immediately won over. That's the only thing I knew about this cover, really, before I started researching. Um, I'm not the biggest metalhead. Please correct me. Add everything in the note, the uh, YouTube comments that I for I'm leaving out. You know, I'm not an all-knowing expert. It meant this is meant to be a community thing. So please do chime in. Um, the only thing I knew is that I thought the band didn't like it um, and that they reluctantly put it on the cover and because it was too late to get anything else. And then uh, it became successful anyway. Anyway, but here's what Larry says. Um, he says, but then someone in the band showed it to their mother and their mother thought it was disgusting. So they knew they were on to something. What if the mom loved it? And we would never have this cover. What if she was like, ooh, spooky. Love it. Proud of you. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad she was grossed out, I guess. And from another source, Carrie King did not like it. One quote I found said that Carrie King called Larry a warped, demented freak. Which, wouldn't that be a compliment if you're the Slayer artist? Um, also, cry so anyway, he... Larry goes on to create the covers for the next three albums, South of Heaven, Seasons in the Abyss, and Christ Illusion, right? And that one was banned in India because Christ was uh, missing limbs and in a sea of blood with severed heads, as you do, on a metal cover, which today, by today's standards, is pretty, it's pretty tame. Anyway, so... All of those pieces, uh, for all those record covers, he they were mixed media works, and Larry explains his process. Um, he says, "Let's and let's." While I'm explaining this, I'm gonna I'm gonna put Rain and Blood up on the screen just to kind of take a little trip around the record cover. If you're not watching on YouTube, you should. That all the pieces are mixed media works. The materials I use are often acrylic oil and collaged photocopied drawings. Um, I often make drawings and then photocopy them on a Xerox machine. Cool brag. Um, and he says it's something he's been doing since the 70s. Um, and then he says he enlarges it, multiplies, blah, blah, blah. And now they have, he says, now they have Photoshop, but what I was doing was much more organic and physical. I still prefer this to the computer. Okay, ring the hot take alarm. <laughs> When is physical uh, analog art not better? It always, usually is. So anyway, um, then the label, there's a rumor that they were going to not release this because of the imagery, but it was corrected later by the band that said it's not true. It's because uh, the lyrics for Angel of Death uh, were, were supposedly, uh, they were accused of being Nazi sympathizers because of those lyrics, um, which they denied. But that's a tricky subject. If you're not outwardly anti-Nazi, people are like, why are you doing this? 
So they said it was because of Angel of Death and not because of the artwork. But that didn't happen. It did get released. Tom Araya said we needed to have an album sleeve that reflected what we were about. He says that they weren't after their version of Iron Maiden's Eddie, um, but it needed to be striking. I think they were after Eddie. I think that's why they didn't like it at first, because it was so dark. I don't know. There wasn't a mascot, which, by the way, I'm going to be doing a Metal Mascots episode um, coming up probably in the next year. I've been working on it for a while. I'm very excited. So basically, they took inspiration from Raining Blood. They wanted the distinct feel of being trapped for, in hell for eternity. Um, and I guess that was also in the artist brief. Or he says that's where the album concept came from. And we commissioned an illustration, especially for the cover, giving this idea as the basis. So that was it. We want to make people ill. We want the feeling of being trapped in hell for eternity. And we want it to tie into Raining Blood somehow. Cool. So yeah, so they hired Larry and he actually came back with two paintings or two mixed media works. And they liked different aspects of both and asked him to amalgamate them into one single picture. Let's see. Carrie King says this really interesting thing. Um, he says, we've always tried to make sure that what you saw on the sleeve reflected the music. That is the goal, right? Um, and he said it had to be extreme in a way we've done the job if it makes pop fans feel ill. <laughs> so that's where that little pull quote came from. Um, when Carol did the artwork, it was designer Steve Byram who gave it form and emotion. And I think it's important. I'm going to put Byram's work up on the screen. Um, it's important to remember with all covers, it's not just the art. Um, you need the everything about the album um, designed by somebody laid out. And it's very rare that you get someone who does both like Barney Bubbles, but not everyone is perfect. Um, so the designer here, Steve Byram, was responsible for, um, and all album designers are responsible for front, typesetting, um, the back, layout, any inserts, center labels, and also, very important, not to be overlooked, the spine. How many times do you think of a record just because it's the one that pops out on the shelf and you're like, oh yeah, there's big boys again. It's pretty smart to make it stand out. So anyway, um, so Byram had recently completed the art direction for Beastie Boys License to Ill Sleeve uh, that same year, and he gave Rain and Blood a unique style combining graphic comics, cartoons, and underground horror. So Steve was sort of the, je the Def Jam designer. Does anyone else think it's funny that Slayer has anything to do with Def Jam. So funny. And Rick Rubin was like the rap rock dude. <laughs> I wonder if they were like, we're not rapping. No. Um, so Steve Byram has so many visual art credit credits on Discogs. Um, LL Cool J Radio. Um, all the packaging for that. Dave Brubeck Quartet. Philip Glass. Boomtown Rats, Indigo Girls, so many different types of artists that he worked with. And that's always a really fun thing to learn, you know, going off on all these different tangents. When you look at one cover at a time and you go, okay, what are the rabbit holes here? Who was involved? What else did they do? Always so interesting learning about this stuff. So that is the Rain and Blood episode. Um, these are Covers a cover mini eps where I go under one cover at a time. Glad I got to know a little bit about Larry. Enjoy dark spooky season. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Subscribe, five-star review, all that. Bye, 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 bye.